The committee will come to order. The first order of business is a matter of committee administration. At our last markup, we welcome our new committee members, Marcy Capture and Mike Quigley. I've consulted with them, along with the subcommittee chairs and the ranking members, about subcommittee assignments. And pursuant to committee rule A1, I'm appointing Ms. Capture to the subcommittee on domestic policy, following Mr. Foster in a new seat. I'm appointing Mr. Quigley to the subcommittee on national security, replacing Mr. Kucinich, who held a temporary seat, and to the subcommittee on government management, following Mr. Murphy in a new seat. These assignments are effective immediately, and we all look forward to your active participation on these subcommittees. We now turn to our legislative business. We are considering bills to strengthen the GAO reform, the Hatch Act for the District of Columbia, and improve the accessibility and interoperability of financial data in the federal government. We also have several postal namings and resolutions to consider as well. The committee will first consider the Government Accountability Office Improvement Act of 2009. This legislation will increase the effectiveness of GAO by clarifying and strengthening GAO's authority to several critical areas, including its access to records. Congress relies heavily on the GAO as a force multiplier in carrying out the investigative and oversight functions vested in the legislative branch. This legislation is necessary to ensure that GAO can successfully carry out all of its functions for the Congress. The GAO Improvement Act addresses a 2002 federal court decision that limited GAO's ability to question agencies' access and determinations in court. The bill explicitly provides the controller, controller General with the standing to pursue litigation if the Controller General determines that the performance of her official duties is harmed by an agency improperly withholding information. The bill clarifies GAO's access to information in two other key areas. First, it confirms GAO's right to make and retain copies of records, which has been denied by federal agencies in some cases, and it provides GAO with the right to interview agency officers and employees. The bill also says, that GAO access to agency information should be limited only if an act passed by the Congress expressly and specifically intends to limit such access. The bill also clarifies GAO's authority to administer oath, an important tool in conducting audits and taking statements. Lastly, it provides agencies more flexibility in reporting to Congress in their responses to GAO recommendation. As this committee knows, GAO helps inform the Congress, executive agencies, and the public about what's being done well and what areas need improvement within the federal government. GAO can only do this effectively if it has access to all the information it needs. The bill strengthens the GAO in this area. It is an important good government initiative that will improve the effectiveness of government operations and better ensure that the taxpayers are getting their money's worth out of vital government programs. I urge all members to support the legislation, and at this time I yield to the ranking member for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing this bipartisan legislation to uh, the uh, full committee today. Uh, under the Emergency Economic Stability Act of 2009, the Controller General was charged with continuing oversight of the activities and performance of the Troubled Assets Relief Program, the TARP. GAO's mission is to look at the overall performance of the TARP and its impact on the financial system. GAO also is required to prepare regular reports to Congress, although under the EESA, GAO has exa can examine the records of the Treasury itself and any of its agencies and representatives. This bill would extend GAO's access 
which is clearly necessary, to the books and records of private entities who have received TARP funds. Under the provisions provided the GA uh, other provisions provide GAO additional uh, progress authorities on, uh, and, re, uh, and ability to gain access as necessary. Mr. Chairman, this is the right bill at the right time to assure the American people that the money committed has been well spent. As the Committee of Primary Jurisdiction for Ensuring Transparency and limiting waste, fraud, and abuse, it is critical that we have our arm, the GAO, an independent agency, able to have the access to the material they need in, in, in order to keep us informed. Unlike other committees, we do not generally uh, go directly to agencies, but rather, whenever possible, work through the GAO and through the IGs in order to achieve the kind of transparency and the leverage of our limited resources. I understand Mr. Kucinich will offer an amendment substantially similar to H.R. 2424, the Federal Reserve Credit uh, Facility Review Act of 2009. Mr. Chairman, I am a co-sponsor of that and will look forward to working on a bipartisan basis to passing that to perfect this bill. I once again thank you for holding this and for holding the spirit of bipartisan transparency that has made this a great Congress thus far. I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the ranking member for his comments. Any other members seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, at the appropriate time, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, we can do it at this moment. <laughs> this is the appropriate time. Uh, let, let, well, hold on one second. Yeah, let me call it the bill first, I guess. If no other member with, uh, wish to speak, uh, I will call up H.R. 2646, the Government Accountability Office Improvement Act of 2009, and ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. And um, Congress. Clerk, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2696, offered by Mr. Kucinich of Ohio. At the end of the bill, add the following the new section. With the rejection, the amendment is considered read. The gentleman is given five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congress and this committee particularly depend on the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, and the audits and reviews they perform to assist us in upholding our oversight responsibilities. But GAO cannot perform audits or conduct reviews of the new credit facilities created by the Federal Reserve in response to the financial crisis. Due to an express prohibition on auditing monetary activities of the Fed contained in Section 714 of Title 31, GAO is not allowed to assist Congress in conducting oversight on the Fed's role in the Troubled Asset Relief Program and the Fed's broader response to the financial crisis. The Fed's response to the crisis dwarfs Treasury's Troubled Asset Relief Program. Since credit markets froze in August 2007, the Fed has taken unprecedented actions to affect fiscal policy by invoking its authority to act in response to, quote, unusual and, ex and exigent circumstances, unquote, no less than 11 times. How extraordinary is this? The last time the Fed did this was in 1934. The Fed's balance sheet has more than doubled over this time. On August 1, 2007, right before the credit crisis began, the balance sheet stood at $874 billion. As of May 13, of this year, the balance sheet stands at $2.198 trillion. My amendment, adapted from the bipartisan bill, H.R. 2424, the Federal Reserve Credit Facility Review Act, which I recently introduced with Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and Ranking Member Jordan, gives the GAO the authority re to review all actions taken by the Fed in response to the ongoing financial crisis. With this authority, GAO will be able to audit, review the activities of, and conduct on-site interviews with personnel of the Fed that are at the center of our nation's response to this financial crisis. My amendment builds on the language of the Grassley Amendment enacted in S-896, 
Unlike the Grassley Amendment, my amendment gives GAO the authority to review all Fed actions taken in response to the crisis, not merely the relatively few actions that meet the dual conditions of being taken in response to unusual and exigent circumstances and dealing, only with, and, and dealing with only a single and specific partnership or corporation. S-896 alone does not give GAO the authority to review the totality of the Fed's actions. And as a result, Congress will have a woefully incomplete understanding of just how extraordinary the Fed's actions have been unless we adopt the Kucinich Amendment today. The authority conveyed to the GAO by the Kucinich Amendment is in response to the extraordinary response of the Fed to the financial crisis. But the amendment is narrowly tailored to allow Congress to conduct necessary oversight without threatening the Fed's independent status. My amendment sunsets five years after enactment in recognition that the financial crisis is temporary in nature and the scope of that authority is limited to the specific credit facilities created by the Fed to respond to the current financial crisis. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Congress has an obligation to protect the American taxpayer and American tax dollars. We rely on GAO to help us do it. And the Fed's multi-trillion dollar response to the financial crisis must also receive informed oversight. And this becomes particularly important because inevitably the full faith and credit of the people of the United States of America must stand behind the Fed's decisions. I would like to thank Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and Ranking Member Jordan from my subcommittee for working with me to craft a strong bipartisan bill, and I urge adoption of my amendment, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Ohio um, for offering this amendment. <clears throat> the intent of this amendment is to correct a consequence from 1978, legislation that shielded the Federal Reserve from GAO review. The Fed's recent intervention aimed at addressing the economic crisis have involved unprecedented assets purchase and lending activities. But these actions have not been subject to any independent audit. That should not be the case. I urge all members to support this amendment. It provides for GAO access to specific programs for a limited period of time which will provide needed oversight without hindering the independence of the Federal Reserve. And I yield now to the ranking member, uh, Congressman Issa from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have already spoken uh, uh, in and support the amendment uh, and was a co-sponsor of the underlying bill that it partially re reflects. And I think Mr. Jordan would like to speak on this, if he could be recognized. I yield time to Mr. Jordan. Well, I, I thank the Chairman and I thank the sponsor of the amendment and, and fully support the amendment. I think it's well crafted, exactly what we need. We, we do have to strike this balance. The Fed is supposed to be independent. I recognize that important um, distinction it has. But I think in these circumstances, this, this amendment is going to be helpful. Uh, and as I said, is crafted uh, in, in the proper, uh, proper fashion and fully supported. Thank you. Any other members seeking recognition? Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to congratulate the authors of this amendment. I, <clears throat> uh, the Federal Reserve, we want to preserve uh, Federal Reserve's independence. We want to make sure it stays flexible uh, so that it can respond in times of economic crisis uh, with alacrity uh, and, de and deliberate speed. But, but on the other hand, there has to also be accountability. And in this most recent financial crisis, as we saw last year and even this year, uh, the Federal Reserve exercised powers that many people didn't even know they had, extraordinary powers, uh, that pumped well in excess of a trillion dollars uh, of credit uh, into the system, correctly so. Uh, but there has to be accountability. And I believe Mr. Kucinich's amendment uh, provides us with a modicum of accountability that keeps the Congress informed and, and keeps uh, the public informed. After all, it is their tax dollars. So I'm prepared to support the amendment and thank Mr. Kucinich for bringing it to our attention. Thank you very much. Any other members? Congressman Foster. Um, you know, first, I'd like to say that you know th this is in a very, very good idea, and I support it. I'm. Uh, I'd like to ask, um, perhaps Representative Kucinich, um, if what the thinking was on protection against um, commercially sensitive information that might be. Would you um, Would you speak uh, into yeah, the mic? Yeah, I was wondering if, if I, I'm concerned that there may be commercially sensitive information that where you'd need some sort of safeguards 
to prevent um, bad um, consequences from, you know, when the GAO reports became public, that th there could be secondary things that we don't appreciate right now? Uh, first of all, since most of these transactions have, have, you know, already occurred, we're just looking at things after the fact. That's number one. So there's no interference in the Fed's ability to be able to, uh, uh, to have its discount window operating and give to people at the much higher rate that they have uh, during this crisis. Uh, the, the Grassley Amendment uh, did not cover term auction, primary dealer, commercial paper, central bank liquidity swaps. And at this point, I think that people who were active on that amendment felt that that was a, a deficit in the amendment. In a sense, this cures some of the limitations of the Grassley Amendment. Uh, you know, all, all of us in this Congress are privy to sensitive information. Uh, part of a democracy is knowing, uh, is taking that responsibility and knowing uh, when not to use it for someone's advantage or someone's disadvantage. And the other point I'd like to make is that independence does not mean a lack of transparency. Uh, independence and transparency are compatible, even integral. And you could argue that they're also self-reinforcing. Uh, would the gentleman yield? For a yes. yes. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I think what you will find uh, on a bipartisan basis here, since we oversee the GAO, is that we will have, always have, their preliminary reports well before they are made public. And I can assure you on my ha behalf, and I am sure the Chairman will do the same, <coughs> that we, the committee members, have access to that at a time in which it is not public, and we would love to work with you in every case to make sure if there is sensitive information for any reason that has somehow escaped the system that it, it be redacted beforehand. And the GAO has always been willing to be receptive to that. So we have not only their past record, which is excellent, but then we have a final check here before the publishing of their reports. If the gentleman would continue to yield. If the gentleman would continue to yield. Um, would continue to yield. Um, um, yes. Uh, I, this committee, as every member knows, routinely comes into possession of highly sensitive information. Uh, when we are talking about the financial uh, matters. Our domestic policy subcommittee has, has looked at a wide range of things that we, we understand at moments that we are constrained to make public uh, because we don't want to interfere in certain market workings. But we also know that the issues of transparency are important here because what happens is that the full faith and credit of the taxpayers of the United States has to stand behind these decisions that are being made. And since our, our constituents inevitably have to pay for these things, uh, we, we ought to at least be in a position of urging uh, that uh, there be transparency through the GAO. Thank you. Yeah. And would gentlemen yield further? Yes. I, have, yeah. well, I have one additional question, sure. um, which is um, the likelihood that this will trigger a referral to the Financial Services Committee. Um, do we have any understanding of that at this point? And I yield to the Chairman if he. It, it, it does not. <clears throat> the underlying consent, the un consent is bill did not. And let me just say that, uh, you know, to just further add onto your uh, other concerns, that uh, the GAO has a very good track record of protecting uh, information. And of course, uh, I think that um, we all can feel comfortable with that. But no, the underlying uh, bill does not. Thank you. I yield back all my time. Any other members seeking recognition? If no other members are seeking recognition, the amendment. The question is on adopting the consentage amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposes? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2646 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2646 to the House. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposes? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2646 is ordered reported. The next order of business is the District of Columbia Hatch Act Reform Act of 2009. The bill was introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia for her opening statement and comments about the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank, uh, thank you for uh, pursuing uh, this matter. This is a pre-home rule ano anomaly. I uh, apologize that the matter would even have to be taken. Is the gentlewoman up. speaking into the mic? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll speak up. Uh, this bill corrects uh, a pre-home rule anomaly when the district, in 1974, the district uh, received the ability to govern itself uh, and got its own local code. Uh, among the leftovers was the application of the Hatch Act, uh, the federal Hatch Act to the district government. Of course, the district government uh, and the federal government were the same before 1974 because uh, Congress, through three commissioners, ruled the district. Uh, somehow or the other, this never got fi fixed. We tried to fix it uh, some years ago, and it passed the House but was not taken up by the Senate. Uh, essentially what this bill does is to apply the Federal Hatch Act restrictions, the very same restrictions that apply to other jurisdictions that receive federal funds. Uh, and that is in each and every respect, an election, solicitation, acceptance, receipt of campaign contributions, the prohibition running for public office in partisan elections, use of on-duty time and resources to engage in partisan political activity, all that other jurisdictions are barred from doing with respect to federal grants they receive would remain intact. What this bill says is that as to local matters and local law and local practices affecting only the District of Columbia, the District of Columbia is obligated to enact a local Hatch Act, uh, and this act will not become effective until the district enacts its own local Hatch Act. Uh, this corrects the, a, a situation that OPM some years ago asked the Congress uh, to offer guidance for because they found that Essentially, a local jurisdiction was forced to uh, or, or heard matters, uh, were matters involving a local jurisdiction were brought to the special counsel who has no expertise and no knowledge of DC laws. You have uh, uh, advisory neighborhood commissioners, as we call them, who run for counsel who were uh, seen as elected officials who could not run for council while in office. These, of course, are volunteers, uh, although they are elected. Uh, this confused the special counsel. Uh, the anomaly here and the, 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 the kind of joke here is that half the members of the, of the city council ran for council while being a advisory neighborhood commissioners. Uh, and we're not prosecuted, but every once in a while one, of course, perhaps for political reasons, finds a complaint against the person uh, to the federal government. Uh, this eliminates that confusion and also eliminates uh, the responsibility, the resources uh, that the special counsel has uh, occasionally had to bring out when receiving such a complaint. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Norton. Uh, this bill, I agree, would ensure that employees of the District of Columbia are subject to the same restrictions on political activities that currently apply to all other state and local government employees. There is no compelling reason to continue to lump D.C. employees with federal employees for the purpose of the Hatch Act especially after the significant changes that were made in 1993. These changes to the Hatch Act structure makes sense and are consistent with the District of Columbia's status as a self-governing jurisdiction. I urge all members to support this bill, and I yield now to the ranking member from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to th thank uh, uh, Representative Norton. This committee, having jurisdiction over the District of Columbia, takes on an obligation sometimes without the full knowledge of the details. Nobody, like Delegate Norton, is able to stay day after day on top of the nuances of what is not right 
in how we treat the nation's capital. So I commend the gentlelady for this sensible piece of legislation uh, in a timely fashion. I look forward to voting for it. I urge my colleagues to vote for it. Uh, I believe that I can say for, for all of us on this side of the aisle who support home rule that, in fact, we look forward to working with uh, Ms. Norton again and again and again to find these kinds of fixes, work together to get them fixed, because nobody can uh, do a better job of running D.C. than D.C., and nobody cares more about uh, the District of Columbia being run well uh, than Ms. Norton. So I urge my colleagues to support it and yield back the balance of my time. Yeah. Any other um, members seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, just, from Ohio. I, I want to echo the remarks of my colleagues in support of uh, uh, Ms. Norton's bill and to thank the gentlelady for always uh, being there to keep us informed about the, uh, uh, the, the needs of her constituents. Thank you. If there are no additional speakers, I ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1345 be discharged from the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia. Without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> I now call up H.R. 1345. I ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1345 be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Th without objection. Hearing no, hearing none, are there any other amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 1345 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on the favorably reporting H.R. 1345 to the House. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. Next order of business. No. And the bill reported. Uh, H.R. 2392 is the next order of business. The committee will now consider the Government Information Transparency Act. This bill was introduced by Ranking Member ISA to improve the availability and inter interoperability of financial data reported to the government by the private sector. The idea for this bill came from oversight hearings that the committee held on, the t on TARP, an economic stimulus program. It will require the adoption of standards for reporting data that makes it user-friendly, searchable, and interactive. We have worked on this bill in a bipartisan manner and will consider an amendment that ensures that the government adopts appropriate standards for transparency and consistency while being open to the latest emerging technologies. I thank the ranking member for this work on this issue and will yield him time to describe the amendment and to suggest support. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd, uh, uh, quite frankly, I'd, I'd, rather than making an opening statement, I'd ask to, that uh, uh, I'll simply speak on the amendment when it's called up and uh, ask that the bill be uh, considered as read and open for amendment uh, at your soonest convenience. If no, other members wish if no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 2392, the Government Information Transparency Act of 2009, and ask unanimous consent that the bill We'd be considered. H.R. 2392, a bill to improve the effectiveness of the government's collection, analysis, and dissemination. The bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, manager's amendment at the desk. Clerk would designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2392, offered by Mr. Issa of California and Mr. Towns of New York. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section. Objection. The amendment is considered as read. I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes to speak on his amendment. Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's seldom uh, so easy and so enjoyable to, uh, to work on a very difficult and complex issue as this has been. Uh, this is truly our bill, Mr. Chairman, and this is truly our amendment. Our staffs have worked hand in hand on what is, in fact, a vexing problem. How do we, the Government Oversight Committee, 
create the ability for not just our, our direct agencies, but all of government and all of America to have transparent access to material uh, that it has a right to, material which is public but often vexing to try to get to the bottom to, of. Government agencies and non-government agencies alike, in, in an effort to create their own databases that suit their needs, often create databases which are not searchable even within a single uh, part of government, uh, such as DOD, which cannot search other parts of DOD, Army, which cannot understand Navy and the like. This legislation, the Government Information Transparency Act, is an effort to mandate common principles uh, not a single standard, but common principles. Working together, majority and minority staff, hand in hand, we have had the opportunity to meet with a number of standard setting organizations and have found that this, this can be done, that had we done, had we done this in a previous Congress, the very meltdown that we now uh, today all know all too much about in the financial market may have been avoided. The, the, the ability to find the kinds of, of information that would lead someone to be able to look at a 10,000 mortgage instrument that has been bonded and sold in pieces did not exist, and yet the information existed. In every, uh, uh, in every office there was paper somewhere that would have allowed us to easily see what the underlying home was on a mortgage, and as such what the neighbor's home was worth, and as such what the asset in totality, some thousand or ten thousand homes, would be worth if you added up the sum of all of its parts. Realizing that that is a step beyond what this bill is doing here today, we are setting the starting point by saying that the federal government will create transparency wherever it has a role, wherever it has information. This bill and its amendment is not complete and we will continue to work before it goes to the floor to refine any additional items we discover. What we have discovered is with the amendment, we will be able to get the United States working at least as well as 40 countries around the world in setting standards for common and interoperable searches. Using this open format technology protocol called for Anyone having access to information will be able to search not just the information of one database, but the information of all databases to compare and contrast what is said in one arena versus what might actually occur in another. Mr. Chairman, it is a great pleasure to talk about, for just one more minute, the implementing of a standard which will be the legacy of this committee for years and I would hope even decades to come. If we can get government to be transparent to the people of America, so just as one Googles to see whether their friend's face or their, uh, their classmates from high school are online, you should be able to find out whether government is paying too much or being defrauded. This is the beginning of that step. I commend the chairman for working, and not just as a, on a bipartisan, and I appreciate it was bipartisan, but as partners on this. And I look forward to continuing working as full partners because this is the only way that we can create the transparency that the American people want so badly. I thank you again for this first step and uh, ask all to consider the amendment favorably and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for offering uh, this amendment. As we have uh, discussed, the goal is to write this bill in a way that requires the government to adopt a single, inoperable, and highly functional standard, but not get locked into any one particular, particular technology so the requirements can be updated as technology changes. I think this amendment accomplishes that, and I support its adoption. Do any other members seek to be recognized? Gentleman from Virginia. I thank the Chair, and I thank Mr. Issa for his, uh, his uh, thoughtful statement, and I uh, certainly believe that the goal contained herein is, is a laudable goal and will serve the public interest. I just, have, uh, I just have some technical questions, just very few. I'm looking at um, agencies that are exempted uh, on page 4, and I guess uh, I'd ask uh, why is the GAO exempted? And then my second question about that is, what about sensitive agencies 
where we may not want transparency um, in, in the interest of national security. What was the consideration given to them? If the gentleman would yield. Or do you want to? Would, would the gentleman yield? I yield to the gentleman yep. from California. Uh, the, first of all, the uh, nature of the Government Accountability Office is, is often that their information would, by definition, be closed. And I think uh, Mr. Foster said it very well. You know, we, we want to make sure that when they make information available, it's only after thorough review, because they do have access so often to information which is not uh, intended to be made public except in an aggregate final format. Uh, certainly, the Federal Election Commission uh, enjoys a outside of, of of necessarily our purview, so we deliberately uh, left them out of them here for at least for now. And and quite frankly, they're pretty searchable as it is. Uh, the uh, I'm going to not answer the question of the District of Columbia. I consider that to be said. Uh, and uh, the uh, the question of sensitive information, which I think is the most important one here, the format and structure does not mean that it is available. Something can be in this structure and completely searchable by the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and no one else. And so the, this is, is as much a tool for those who have access as continued security systems will prevent someone from having access but still know that if it were authorized, you would be able to get it. So I, I would hope that everyone understands that this does not change the fact that classification could limit access to any material, but if you have the clearances, your ability to get it almost instantaneously would be assured. I thank the Chairman of the Gentleman Ranking Member. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleague from Virginia uh, addressed the issue I had. I, I just want to tell you, as the newest member of this committee, I, I wasn't brief that a bipartisan efforts were so successful here. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the chairman and the uh, ranking member for their efforts here. Uh, this, again, follows the reason I wanted to be on this committee, and that is the, the wise man who uh, said that the best dis disinfectant of government is illumination. So I look forward to working with uh, all of you uh, toward the end as we continue these efforts. Right. Delighted to have you on the committee. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, um, I, I applaud you all for this uh, legislation. Um, one of the things that I have said is uh, in our economic situation that we find ourselves in, um, the only way that we are going to get out of this is that the American people cooperate with us and feel good about what we are doing. The best way to do that is to have transparency. I don't care how you look at it. When I look, Mr. Chairman, at what has happened with regard to AIG and a lot of these other companies, they and th it, uh, the, the distrust that has grown out of it is, is a failure to be transparent. I mean, I, I don't think a lot of these folks would have any problems if they were just transparent. And I think this is what this goes towards doing, and I'm um, looking forward to uh, perfecting it. And uh, again, I want to thank you all for your uh, ranking member and the chairman for your uh, efforts. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member for um, this important step. I have a question. Um, I was uh, pleased to, to read in, in the uh, memo that, that perhaps we are recognizing uh, that this is a global economy and that other countries are beginning to move to XBRL but that uh, this that and agencies would not be obliged to use it um yeah it that this is my, my my question goes to whether or not a universal language is in fact uh coming forward um and what does it mean that we'd have it but agencies couldn't use it or is it that this may not be the one that they use that there are other versions, for example. If the gentlelady would yield. Uh, uh, be class to yield to the gentleman. I think, gentlelady. Uh, we were very sensitive that although XBRL has been selected by many countries and certainly by the SEC most recently, and that it is an open standard of a nonprofit entity, that we did not want to have our legislation mandate a specific by name interoperable system. Because the idea that, uh, that what is today known as XBRL uh, could potentially partner into an expanded uh, multidiscipline 
uh, interoperable system or that others could supplant it. We felt that government, even though this is a nonprofit and so on, should not be mandating it. It is clear that the legislation speaks to what we have learned from this open standard which has been recently accepted by the SEC and others. And when I spoke about the ability to drill down and see actually where the money went or what the value of an underlying uh, piece of instrument would be if you could see all of the loans in it, I was speaking to that technology that we've had demonstrated. So I, I hope the general lady is sensitive, just as I, I expect that the District of Columbia will embrace this, but under home rule, we would hope that they would make their own decision. Once a decision has been made by the federal government, I take it all agencies would be expected to use whatever is the universal language that had been adopted? Uh, we, we fully would expect it, it to, to happen. Uh, we did have some carve-outs because of certain sensitivities, including the district and, and the Federal Election Commission. Uh, but we believe that this is the first step. Ultimately, we believe this is a step that will be both publicly and privately adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And let me just, just reassure you that OMB is also uh, assigned to make certain to, to encourage all agencies to use it. Um, Congressman Cuellar from um, Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and to you and the ranking member, I want to say congratulations. I think this is a, an extremely important step. You know, one of the uh, biggest um, responsibilities we have as members of Congress is to provide um, legislative oversight. And in order to provide legislative oversight to see if an agency is being efficient, effective, and accountable, you got to have the data and the information that's identifiable that you can get out and extract. And, and so we, not only uh, for the outside, the public, but especially for us to do the, the legislative oversight. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I think on June 18th, I have a hearing on another bill, uh, H.R. 2142, that deals with the assessment of the performance of agencies, the improvement of uh, the operations of agencies. And the reason I say that about this particular bill is that one of the things I've seen, as the, at least in my experience at the state level in Texas, was in order to assess the improvement and the assessments of agencies, you got to have the data. And if you don't have the data, then you can't do the work. Uh, so this step, um, uh, I have to say that this is an extremely important step to provide not only for the outside public, but for us to do our legislative uh, oversight, which is probably one of our most important, if not the most important, uh, responsibility as members of Congress. So to Mr. Chairman, to you and to Mr. Issa, I, I really wanted to say thank you, because this is, you know, I want to emphasize to the members, this is an extremely important step so we can follow up on the other steps that we need to follow. So Mr. Chairman and Mr. Issa, congratulations on this. I certainly support this bill. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Congressman Kucinich from Ohio. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the chair and Mr. Issa for uh, bringing this committee together on this important piece of legislation. Uh, let's look at this from a practical matter. Think of not just how the government's grown over the years, but how the flow of information has accelerated. Every one of us has bits of information coming at us uh, so quick Sometimes it's like standing uh, in, a, in a blizzard, watching information come by, and you try to catch a snowflake to analyze it. It's almost impossible. When you look at the financial crisis that is, has just swamped this country, and if you try to look at a single, the response of a single financial entity and its relationship with the government, it's very hard to track it. This legislation sets the stage for Congress to be able to better do its job, number one. Number two, for the work of the government and its relationship with the private sector to be more comprehensible and transparent and subject to, to scrutiny and more careful evaluation. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, having someone on this committee uh, with the background that Mr. Issa has in, in uh, business and finance has been very important because you, you, bring, you brought to the committee an understanding of how um, certain principles uh, from the private sector can work in government and, uh, and, and vice versa, of course. So I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Rice and Mr. Towns uh, for this legislation. I, I think this, this can only uh, help us better understand uh, the uh, events that are occurring around us and having a single um, data standard for the collection, analysis, and dissemination of, uh, of
business and financial information is going to, uh, it's a very positive step. But it's a, it's, it's a quite significant step. It's gonna, I think it's going to be one of the contributions that this, the, the work of this committee to, to the country. Thank you. Any other members seeking recognition? Congressman Foster of Illinois. Yes. Um, well, I have a, uh, I guess, a technical concern about um, whether this will be a straitjacket for the analysis of the information. I mean, this XBRL, I take it, is an XML extension? Is that, yes. That's correct. Yeah. And so it's a text-based thing. That means for very large data sets, it's going to be rather inefficient. Um, no, actually, it's fully SQL and Oracle compliant. Okay. Uh, it's more of a discipline uh, than it is specific comma separated. All right. So the, there's a... Not, not a huge hit in the density of the data when you transmit it in this format? No, no, not at all. Okay. And then As a matter of fact, you can do a search, abbreviate just what you want, but you know that each of the tags is going to have a common, for a given entity, there's a discipline to say it will be defined as, which really is what allows you to say this will be defined as this, therefore wherever you find it, you can bring it together. Got it. Um, okay, and then um, my other concern is whether, um, you know, usually you will use this as a data exchange standard, but then you will import it into, you know, a binary database or something like this. And, and this would seem to, by mandating that this be used for analysis, be sort of a straitjacket that would not allow a more efficient binary database to be used internally in the government analyses. If, if. Uh, I, I completely agree with you that, if the gentleman would yield. Yes. That, uh, that this is a potential concern, but when, when, as the legislation is written, and if you have further concerns, we certainly would work as this goes to the floor, the, uh, the intention is, is that if, if something is made available for analysis, in a for, not to your desktop, but to analysis to the outside world, that it maintain the discipline of the common format so that an analysis is searchable just as the core data is searchable, but in fact, if you're doing an analysis, you're certainly able to bring it in uh, on a selective basis in any format. Right. Yeah. So that my reclaiming my time, the um, the collection and dissemination sounds like what you're talking about, and but mandating it for analysis seems like it might be overly prescriptive. That was my. And I can, if the gentleman would yield again, uh, I would certainly uh, look forward to working with the gentleman to define that either in report language or in the, the bill itself between now and the floor to make sure it's clear that we are, we are not trying to straitjacket anybody beyond the format that ultimately others will search, but not the individual. I understand. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I yield back. No other members seeking recognition. All those in favor, of course, uh, let me, uh, if, if there's no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the ISA amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2392 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favor of reporting H.R. 2392 to the House. All those in favor? Aye. Opposes? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2392 is ordered reported. Postal and resolutions. Let me, uh, which is the final order, order of business today. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions and bills be considered in block and read and open to amendment at any time. These resolutions and postal naming bills include H.R. Res 420, introduced by Representative Robert Latta. It celebrates the United States flag and supports the goal and ideals of Flag Day, which will be commemorated on June the 14th this year. Uh, HRES 435, introduced by Representative Mike Hunter, supports the goal and ideals of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I have a manager's amendment at the desk updating this bill, and I ask unanimous consent that it be adopted and considered as the base text, without objections, so ordered. H.R. 2325, introduced by Representative Henry Cuellar, designates a facility of the United States Postal Service located in Laredo, Texas as the Laredo Veterans Post Office. H.R. 2422 introduced by Representative John Carter 
designates a facility of the United States Postal Service located in Georgetown, Texas, as the Kyle G. West Post Office Building. Avi manages the amendment at the desk on this measure that corrects spelling, and I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be adopted and uh, considered uh, as the base text without objections so ordered. H.R. 2470, introduced by Representative Thomas Rooney, designates the facility of the United States Postal Service located in Port Charlotte, Florida, as a Lieutenant Commander Roy H. Baum Post Office Building. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments on these bills? Yes, Mr. Chairman, briefly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have reviewed the postal namings and resolutions and find that they meet the requirements of the committee and urge their adoption. Yield back. Other members seeking recognition. Well, I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably by the committee without objection so ordered. This concludes our business for today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered, um, reported, without objections, so ordered. If there are no other business, the committee stands adjourned. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you.